You are falling, falling through darkness. Then a glimmer of white light emerges in the distance and suddenly it is all you see, filling your vision with an unbearable brightness. But in the midst of the blinding white is a speck of black which grows rapidly until you are once again immersed in a pool of cool darkness. Then the light comes once more, washing over you like a wave. Flashes of white and black flicker past as you try to get your bearings, but there is nothing. Only you, the void, and the lights. Black, white, white, black. On and off, endlessly, forever. You hear the voice of a young girl speaking to you through the vortex. At first there was darkness, she says, and with it came light. The lights are incessant. You reach out your hands to shield your eyes and discover you have none. You are a being without a body. The voice continues. And from the thread between the two followed everything else. You watch as the light hurtling towards you splits in two and a black dot forms at each center, creating a set of eyes that continue to grow. Then the pupils split, mimicking mitosis, creating two black figure eights. Another set of eyes grows in the pupils of the previous, and what was once black becomes white again as the fractal repeats in a dizzying display. You are swept through its passages at random, unable to control your trajectory, aware only of the other paths which flicker past your peripheries. The light begins to slow as the white pearl of the throne room comes back into focus, the silhouette of a young girl sitting as a black dot in its very center. As she grows larger, reality comes rushing back and you remember where you were. In Wonderland, the town of Um, the palace, the princess. The girl gazes at you expectantly and you realize you have regained your feet. The vision having ceased only moments ago feels like a distant memory. What was that? you ask, feeling rather ill. Don't you remember? inquires the princess. You wanted me to show you what good reason looks like. How... how did you do that? you ask. Like this. The princess proceeds to withdraw a small brass lamp from her robes with the letters M.U. engraved on the side. She gives it a rub and a wisp of silver smoke creeps out, pooling on the floor of the throne room and slowly collecting into the head of a man. He is old but ageless wrinkled features pronouncing a feeling of gaiety that is relaxed and effervescent. He has a pointed face and long, thin, silver goatee that floats down to the ground and mixes with the surrounding smoke. He is bald, except for two wisps of white hair which stick up by each ear. His eyes twinkle with an eerie air of mystery, and his smile suggests the subtle hint of a secret. "'What would you like now, princess?' Oh, great Mujinshin, cries the girl. You must have made some sort of mistake, for our guest now no longer remembers the conversation we had here mere moments ago. Refresh their memory, will you? With pleasure, says the jinn, dissolving into a great cloud of gray smoke that swoops towards you, <laughs> engulfing you whole. Your mind's eye is filled with the vision of the throne room, but you are no longer inside of your body. Instead, you watch it from above, looking down upon the scene below. I'm quite curious to know how a girl as young as you rules over a place as prosperous as this, you hear yourself say. Good reason, the princess tells you plainly. That's it? you ask, rather taken aback. Yes, she says, that's it. Show me, you implore her. All right, agrees the girl. She reaches into her robes and withdraws a small brass lamp with the letters M.U. engraved on the side and gives it a rub. A trail of silver smoke pours out of the stem and fills the room, consuming you and the princess in a brilliant silver light before coalescing into the face of a man mere inches from yours. You watch yourself startle and step back a few paces. Who have we here, my dear? asks the jinn with a grin. Oh, great Mujinshin, oh, wise wazir, this visitor here would like to know what good reason looks like. Would you show them? 
With pleasure, says he, dissipating once again into a cloud of smoke and engulfing you entirely, immersing you in a void of murky black with no end. Suddenly, you are falling. Chapter 1, zero 01. Welcome back to Wonderland. We are starting our second season at the very beginning, going all the way down to bedrock, the essence of reality that sits at the underbelly of all that we know to be true. Today, we will be talking about relation, computation, chaos, order, and the integral energy that pervades through it all. The Taoist symbol of Taiji more commonly referred to as the yin-yang, represents the idea that all things exist in relation. It is represented by a black and white fish intertwined in a circle, with the eye of each as the color of the other. Yang is the white, the masculine. He represents order, positivity, warmth, and action. Yin is the black, the feminine. She represents chaos, negativity, coldness, and passivity. These two are intertwined in an internal dance, contrary but complementary and codependent. They are corollaries, with the formation of one necessitating the derivation of the other. Sunbeams are yang, while their shadows are yin. A pitch is yang, and the catch is yin. One starts an action, and the other completes it. And just as their eyes suggest, each contains the seed of its opposite. Every revolution brings about a new order, just as every system eventually devolves back into chaos. The philosopher Robert Piercig described these two mutually dependent yet opposing forces as dynamic and static quality. Yin is dynamic, chaotic, ever-changing, and unpredictable. Yang is static, solid, structured, and therefore breakable. The tension between the two is what allows for our survival— Static quality preserves the status quo, while dynamic quality is constantly challenging and reinventing it. Each force is necessary to sustain the other, and therefore neither can be considered superior. The very notion of existence demands this concept of relation. Zero is a consequence of one. They come into being concurrently as one cannot exist without the other. Something implies the potential for nothing, but true nothingness can have no name, as there would be no being to name it. The concept of darkness is contingent upon the existence of light, which illuminates their difference. This is why the Bible begins with, let there be light, thus giving form to the formless and bringing substance to the earth. The interplay of opposing forces is what gives things their form, as Escher demonstrates through his figure and ground lithographs, Meaning must be derived through relation, as all things are defined by the differences between them. We cannot say that something is long without having the concept of shortness as a referent. In order for an object to have a discernible quality, we must be able to identify another one which does not. Without difference, all becomes one, which is nearly the same as being nothing at all. To say black and white demands the and, a frame. The acknowledgement of relation brings about a third dimension, that which emerges through their unification. It can be found in neither part alone, but only through their conversation, which creates something new. And once you have the and, you can reiterate this process recursively, continually stepping outside of and looking beyond the bounds you have created. The one demands two, which brings about three and gives way to the many. In other words, you can never capture something entirely because once you create a boundary, you've developed a new frontier. Imagine drawing a black dot on a sheet of paper. That's something. Now circle the dot to demonstrate how it gains shape with relation to the white. Circle that circle, and now you have both black and white. Circle that circle, and now you have frame slipping. You can never capture the entire image without failing to account for the net you threw around it. This is the same conundrum that causes children to ask what sits outside the universe. 
and led to the derivation of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. You can never have a self-containing system because no framework can be all-encompassing. It's turtles all the way down. This notion of infinite regression speaks to the fractal nature of reality. Not only can you always go up another level of analysis, but the nature of the contents contained therein are similarly slippery. This phenomenon is demonstrated by things like the coastline paradox. Any attempt at objectively measuring the coastline of an island varies depending upon the unit of measurement. The jagged coast is filled with nooks and crannies which can either be overlooked or accounted for, depending upon the size of the ruler. The closer you look, the longer it gets, as more details are added to the total. This subversion of expectation is like an inversion of Zeno's paradox, where an increasing by half-length increments never gets a mover to their destination. In both instances, there is always territory left unexplored. Binary notation uses this notion of relation and frame slipping to encode increasingly complex information. A single bit, or binary digit, has two possible states, zero or one. If you wanted to count to one in binary, then these two digits would suffice on their own. But in order to account for the number two, you must step outside of the system by layering in another dimension of information, a second bit. This second bit is added to the left of the first and provides an additional two units of information, allowing us to represent the numbers 2, 1, 0, and 3, 1, 1. This process can be repeated ad infinitum, with each added bit increasing the total representative capacity of the system by a power of 2. Thus, an 8-bit system can represent numbers as high as 255 using only 8 units of information and 2 digits. This same process of encoding can be used to represent letters and symbols, but because these concepts are abstract rather than mathematical, there is no direct isomorphism between the relationships within the data structure and the meaning they are intended to convey. A translator must step in to interpret the code. Chapter 2. The Rhizome You find yourself back in the throne room with the djinn and princess gazing at you expectantly. I still don't understand, you say. How does what you showed me have anything to do with good reason? It has to do with the law of life itself, and from there good reason must follow. For the town of Um is founded upon one common understanding. We know what law is natural law and what law is our own. She says this with an air of finality, which leaves you feeling more confused than ever. The girl notes your expression and muses, Maybe you would understand better by seeing things from a different perspective. After all, a map always leaves something lost in translation. It's only in three dimensions where you get a real sense of substance. She looks to her left where the smoky head of the djinn is perched on the arm of her throne his long beard trailing down to the ground in a thin wisp. Oh, great Mujinshin, would you please show us another one of your marvelous visions? Take this as inspiration, she says, unclasping the green amulet from around her neck. The djinn eagerly opens his mouth wide in anticipation as the girl drops the emerald necklace inside. Immediately, he begins to laugh, green clouds erupting from his mouth along with beams of brilliant lime light which bounce across the walls. A web of energy forms in the air as the room is engulfed in a hazy splendor. Soon you can see nothing but the princess standing before you, immersed in green smoke. She reaches out and plucks one of the bands of light like a violin. The effect reverberates throughout the space, rippling across a network of invisible strings and sending beams of yellow-green shooting towards you. Now you're in the thick of it, she says with a smile. Follow the light and you will find what you seek. You gaze around the once room, the hazy green causing the lattice of light to seem without end. A low glow creeps throughout the structure, moving along spandrels and coalescing in various locations, collecting in thick bundles which seem to pulsate with an energy of their own. 
You pass your hand through a nearby beam and it disintegrates in your fingertips before slowly regaining its form. I've seen this before, you remark. In the forest, the cracked mud, the anthill. Yes, breathes the princess. These trails have a way of always leading back to one another. The trees may look different, but their roots are all the same. You venture towards where the locus of light seems to grow thickest, but as you approach, it dissipates down new threads in different directions, like a pool of minnows evading capture. You track the changes and try to keep up with the current, but to no avail, the energy is elusive, always a few feet further than your reach. I can't keep up, you lament. It's faster than I am. So then what have you learned? The girl asks. And you look back at her, bewildered. The notion of frame slipping has an important implication, which is that what seems to be true varies depending upon your level of analysis. From afar, a depiction of yin may appear to be all black, while when standing too close, you would only be able to see her white center. Any truth statement you may wish to make also has edge cases of untruth. We fall into language and logic games which create fuzzy borders around what we can claim to know. You may insist that one and one is always two, but start applying this abstract principle to concrete reality, and suddenly the conclusions are not so clear. Two raindrops will slide down a window pane to create a larger one, and two rabbits can bring about a family of three or even thirteen. To place mathematical ideals above the workings of the world forgets that we use math as a tool to explore reality and not vice versa. The truth is hardly ever a matter of either or, but almost always better understood as yes and. There is no reason to artificially limit the routes through which we can derive meaningful knowledge. Truth is therefore relational, context-dependent, and ever-changing. Something that could be said to be heavy in one circumstance may be light in another. This is not to say that the objects do not have an objective quality, but the paths through which we define objectivity are slippery and constructed out of other sets of relations. As Piersig says, to define something subordinates it to a tangle of intellectual relationships. The concepts of good and evil, for instance, are the products of a specific selection of reality rather than an impermeable absolute. Any particular rule you may wish to define as to what constitutes the good can easily be subverted by example. It is good to give a parched man water, but not good if the water is poisoned. It is good for a parent to protect their child, but not good if they are overbearing. What constitutes moderation will always vary given the specific circumstance. Optical and auditory illusions demonstrate that even things like our perceptions of color and sound will vary depending upon their surrounding contexts. The nature of the relationships may be objective and real, but this does not mean that timeless truisms can be easily extracted. I believe this is why so many religions refuse to define or speak the name of God. By its very nature, God must be that which transcends all language and limitation. The Jewish philosopher Maimonides is known for saying that, We cannot know what God is, only what God is not. For to say that God is equivalent to X suggests that the essence of the divine can be captured and broken down into parts. This is why the first commandment of the Old Testament warns against idolatry, and the Tao Te Ching claims that the Tao which can be named is not the Tao. Likewise, a central tenet of Zen Buddhism is that it is impossible to characterize what Zen is, as it will always spill over and step outside of conceptual capture. This is what Robert Piercek refers to as dynamic or undefined quality. It cannot be contained in any system or framework as it is the force that subverts and questions the status quo. In a complex system, dynamic quality is the lone ant pursuing a new path down an uncharted trail, 
or the genetic mutation which causes a species to evolve in a new direction. It is what creates anti-fragility in systems by employing random error to their benefit and growing stronger by continually adapting in relation to the environment. Any fixed pattern of values will eventually become outdated and start to erode the force of life it was established to protect. Concepts are static, while reality is dynamic and ever-changing. Thus, there is always a discrepancy between the two. While all truths are context-dependent, some truths are deeper than others. Like in the flow of ocean currents, the bottom of the seafloor moves slowly and gradually, while the top layers are constantly shifting and changing trajectory. Everything moves eventually, but some patterns are more stable and longer-lasting. This implies that many different interpretive frameworks may all have meaningful things to say about the world, while appearing contradictory on a surface level. Some religious systems encourage substance use while others discourage it, and both do so for good reasons. The spiritual insights one may access on a peyote trip are not equivalent to the recklessness of daily drunkenness. These competing systems of thought can be conceptualized as paintings in an art gallery. No one painting will show you the full picture, but each provides its own unique point of view. Different people will be drawn to different perspectives for different reasons. No one particular representation holds objective merit over the others. This meta-theory is therefore like a map of the gallery placed on the wall, encouraging visitors to examine the various pieces. The rhizome is a concept coined by French philosophers Deleuze and Guattari to describe a network of relations that resemble the structure of roots. All points are interconnected and interdependent, unfolding in a nonlinear manner with no consistent source of authority. A social media network is a perfect example of a rhizome. Each user represents a node of relations which can both influence and be influenced by other users. Whatever is trending that week demonstrates where the most activity is concentrated, but the collective ethos is always shifting. The patterns of energy which pulsate through the digital system may congregate in some central areas, but these flows will change with the passage of time. Wikipedia shows you the rhizomatic structure of information better than a traditional encyclopedia by using links between the articles. This demonstrates that the content is not to be understood linearly, but as an entangled whole, providing a richer understanding by allowing you to traverse the relationships between the ideas. In doing so, the website operates in three dimensions rather than two and creates a more accurate depiction of reality. Part of the reason it is difficult to represent an idea in a linear form is because all of its contents are interrelated, yet some of these bonds must be broken apart so that it can be flattened to a page. This causes distortions to occur as it allows for some relationships to be highlighted while sacrificing the accuracy of others. Alternatively, a rhizome has multiple points of entry and is composed of dimensions in motion. It has no clear hierarchy, no beginning or end. Everything is suspended in an endless milieu. This isn't to say that no hierarchies can manifest, but they are always contingent and relational. Someone who dominates in one field may be a small player in another. A frog is predator to the fly and prey to the cat. What was once modern art becomes classic as dynamic quality calcifies into static. There are no true contradictions, but many frame-dependent ones will arise when you look at the same phenomena through different lenses. When you start to think of reality in this way, you quickly realize that there is no solid ground at all. Things come into existence through their relations with others, and what is figure for one is turned to ground for the rest. A plant forms a rhizome with its environment, taking information from the wind, sun, water, animals, and soil to determine where to grow. But the animals also form a rhizome with the plant and will react to its behavior accordingly. Each informs the other in an iterative fashion, generating epiphenomena which have a causal power of their own. Flowers and hummingbirds have co-evolved in a manner that now makes them mutually dependent, with the birds relying upon the flowers for their nutritious nectar and the flowers upon the birds for their pollination. 
These nexes of causal power are referred to by Deleuze as plateaus, which he describes as continuous, self-vibrating regions of intensities. Any set of ideas with enough weight to merit a Wikipedia page or social identity worthy of a Twitter account could be considered a plateau. They are packages of information which operate as a collective unit upon the world. You are a plateau. Mount Everest is a plateau. The hummingbird is a plateau. And the coevolution between the pollinator and flower is also a plateau. The concept has a fractal quality wherein it can contain sets of itself. The Earth, Solar System, and Milky Way Galaxy are all plateaus, too, each with its own distinct features. This stratification of layers imprisons varying intensities into systems of resonance and redundancy, producing pockets of predictable behavior within the ever-changing network of relations. The structure of the rhizome is self-similar, so that the nodes on one level of analysis constitute the rods of another. Energy flows from people as well as through them, in some instances, you act with agency, and in others, you are acted upon. The same goes for every bee, tree, and blade of grass. All are systems subordinate to systems and constituted out of other systems, be those cells or molecules of DNA. The totality of all of these systems represents one entangled whole, which is constantly acting upon itself. Individual entities are therefore correlations made by us, as they are all members of the same complex web of relations. Reality is nothing more than repeated iterations of distinction throughout a continuous process. As Deleuze writes, the magic formula that pluralism equals monism must be arrived at through the necessary enemy of dualism, with which we are constantly contending. That which sits outside of this totality is referred to as the plane of consistency, the inert grid upon which this entire unfolding is taking place. Chapter 3. The Way All right, Mujinshin, cries the girl. Enough of this. Let's try something else. In an instant, the green smoke and limelight have bounced back into the familiar form of the jinn. Does he grant as many wishes as you like? You ask, a little worried. I don't want you wasting them all on me. In the stories you had heard, Jin's only ever gave three. Don't be silly, the girl laughs. These aren't wishes, mere requests. My great-grandfather who founded Am was a very wise wizard. His only wish from this great Mu Jinshin was that he serve our family as an even wiser wazir. But he made one thing clear. He who wishes for the unearned is a leader insincere, and will send our small town into chaos and fear. The great Mujinshin has honored his behest, and will only oblige the simplest of request. If you want lovers or riches, such nefarious acts are better left to the witches. The Mujinshin, however, will only show others what we already know ourselves. I have no interest in trickery or spells. The princess pauses. Maybe I've been going about this all wrong. If it's truth you seek, I'll show you in the simplest way I know how. She steps down from her throne, leaving the lamp aside, and takes your hand, guiding you behind the great throne to a small wooden door that sat just out of sight. She gestures for you to open it, and you take the brass handle, turning it to reveal a small conservatory with a single tree growing in its very center. The white marble floor gives way to green grass, and despite the late hour, the room is bright with daylight. A small sun sits suspended from the ceiling, shining down upon the scene. My great-grandfather who built the city planted this sapling as its first root. So long as the tree stands, the magic that protects Um shall remain strong. He believed that we are all like trees, starting as seeds that grow wherever the water flows and sun shines. The world shapes the tree, and in turn, the tree slowly starts to shape the world. Maybe a bird builds a nest in its branches, or the trunk is chopped down and turned into a table. You can't control where things are going, but if you lean into the light, you'll give rise to the very best of what the world has to offer. How do I know where the light shines, you ask? The girl takes your hand and brings you into the warm glow of the sun. 
you can feel it. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that things tend towards disorder or entropy over time. A glass once shattered is not easily reconstructed, and two liquids mixed together can't be teased apart. This means that as the universe unfolds, it will become increasingly chaotic and random, requiring more information to represent the entire picture. However, within this chaos emerge pockets of self-organization, complex systems that reinstate order from on high via emergent processes. Ants roaming the forest floor operate through colony dynamics which regulate their behavior, and birds of the same species all sing a specific song. Things that appear to be disordered on one level of analysis are often ordered on another. A scoop of dirt from the ground shows only a tangle of roots and plant matter, but not the broader mycelial network they are members of. In digital encoding, information is compressed by discerning and omitting patterns of regularity. Video files record only the changes that occur between frames, creating a concise representation by emphasizing difference over repetition. These pockets of self-organizing behavior produce a similar analog in the natural world, creating patterns of predictability that temporarily decrease the local entropy within a system. This is what Deleuze is referring to when he talks about plateaus. They are layers of consistency which give rise to particular forms, be they flower fields or bee colonies. There is, however, a distinction between form and content. All matter is made up of subatomic particles which self-organize in different patterns of behavior, giving them distinct qualities. The same material, such as a piece of mahogany, can manifest either as a tree or dining table. The underlying substance is the same, but can have numerous expressions, each with its own set of attributes. Similar to how computer programs are composed entirely of ones and zeros, which are then compiled and processed according to a certain set of rules. Hypothetically, you could take the same underlying source code and run it on two different programs to generate entirely different results. As a matter of fact, Alan Turing invented the computer while studying mathematics when he noted that all equations consist of our data and instruction. He realized that if there was a way to encode the data and parse it according to a specific set of instructions, then complex equations could be easily calculated by machines. A system is said to be Turing complete if it can execute any algorithm using nothing more than ones, zeros, and simple decision-making rules. For instance, Conway's Game of Life is a computer program consisting of an infinite grid of cells which are either living or dead. The game has a simple set of laws dictating how the cells interact with one another. A dead cell will come to life and live on if it has the right amount of living neighbors, but too many or too few neighbors will cause the cell to die again. Depending upon the initial arrangement of live cells, the game can unfold in any number of ways generating a stable pattern, oscillating between a few distinct forms, traversing endlessly across the landscape, or fizzling out entirely. But in some special instances, the initial conditions form a set of relations that progressively continue to expand and grow more complicated over time. This phenomena is known as computational irreducibility, and the physicist Stephen Wolfram believes it possesses the key to understanding reality. Wolfram's physics project is concerned with discovering the lowest level processes through which the richness of experience can evolve. His models of reality employ a hypergraph, or grid, representing an entangled web of relations which bear a striking resemblance to the structure of a rhizome. The notion of irreducibility means that one cannot analyze the initial conditions in order to predict where the process will end up. The only way to discover how a program will unfold is to let it play out. However, within this increasingly complex system are pockets of reducibility, or predictability, which make the practice of science possible. Thus, the whole of reality can be conceptualized as an information processing system, consisting of some initial conditions and simple rules which compound into complex consequences and give rise to the world we experience. Every set of starting principles contains implicit corollaries and emergent properties 
through which the richness of reality is derived. The foundational forces of binary notation, aka relation, compilation, the processing rules of the system, and energy are the basis of computers, virtual worlds, and the laws of life itself. There is a meaningful relationship to be drawn between these ideas and the Christian notion of the Holy Trinity. The laws of the universe are the Father, the rules which are the basis of reality. The initial conditions which led to this particular formation, and not another one, are the Son, the current manifestation of law. And the Holy Spirit is the necessary energy which pervades through the system, giving form to the formless and spurring it ever forward. Energy is therefore the necessary ingredient which brings the program to life, making it active rather than passive potential. A computer program written on a sheet of paper has no computational power. It must be housed in a system that has the capacity to process it. In China, this is referred to as qi, the vital energy force which creates and pervades through all things, breathing life and activity into an otherwise dormant universe. Patterns of energy interrelating is what gives things their form. All matter is composed of energy captured in a stable configuration. The fact that energy is limited is what gives things their particular structure, bringing about a need for efficiency which dictates the way natural systems develop. An interesting takeaway from Wolfram's physics project is the notion that space and time are fundamentally different entities rather than mutually entwined. Under Wolfram's model, time is conceptualized as the process of computation, the successive application of rules which instigate phase transitions and repeatedly transform the structure of reality. The progressive principle is therefore baked into the universe. Things must proceed forward in an iterative fashion, and the notion of computational irreducibility means that it is impossible to predict beyond our current threshold. Even if you could derive and simulate the foundational axioms which created our universe, it would be impossible to jump ahead of the program to see where things are going to go next. There are no shortcuts to discovery. The only way to know where things are going is to let them play out. Life is therefore not predetermined, but an active program, and your conscious experience plays a meaningful part of the process. You exist on the frontier of reality and have the ability to influence how it unfolds acting out a spiritual program of your own. We emerge from the interaction between forces in motion and cannot remove ourselves from the system or sever the bonds that make us who we are. But recognizing these strings of connectivity allows us to leverage them to our advantage. Our awareness is sacred and non-mechanical. We give rise to the world around us through observing and interacting with it. With so many forces acting upon us simultaneously, the question arises as to what we should attend to. The sapling receives information from the surrounding environment, but the environment is ever-changing and inconsistent. So how does it know where to grow? The answer offered by cybernetics is that by having a specific goal in mind, an agent can consistently adjust its behavior in relation to novel contexts. Like steering a ship through stormy weather, you must constantly be turning the wheel to adapt to the winds and waves in the water. As Lao Tzu writes, turning is the motion of the Tao. You must be willing to negotiate with reality if you wish to navigate it successfully. Any static course of action will atrophy over time and therefore can't be a good guide for how to live. To be in harmony with the universe, means you must be attuned to and operate in tandem with its natural flow. So how do you know where to go? Just as the integration between two perspectives allows us to perceive depth, you will find the way where yin and yang press up against one another. Experience is a consequence of contrast, and we have a natural barometer for knowing what feels good. As Robert Piercig writes, Value lies between the subject and object. A hot stove and your hand are value neutral, but put the two together and suddenly you'll have an experience that is unquestionably of low quality. A beautiful piece of music derives its beauty from meeting your ear. It does not need to be studied or broken down or analyzed in order to be understood as good. We impose these analytical tools afterwards in order to justify our initial reaction. 
value is defined by experience alone, and if you seek the good in all the ways you can recognize it, you will slowly but surely start to enact what is best. The path forward may not always be clear, but if you pay attention, you will find that there are little clues everywhere. This idea of pressing up against existence to find your path is incredibly important to me. I don't think there is any other way you can navigate reality successfully. Holding one course of action as an unnegotiable ideal fails to allow you to adapt to the current. It's only by separating yourself from attachments to conclusions or preconceived notions that you can interact with the world on a more intuitive and fundamental level. There are no right or wrong answers, only pushes and pulls which are constantly in motion. Language and concepts limit our understanding of the world while simultaneously being the only tool we have to comprehend it. Differentiation between ideas both brings about meaning and obscures similarity. Often things that appear contradictory on one level of analysis are united by the same underlying principles on another. That's why this episode focused on breaking things down into their smallest possible parts, the fundamental features through which all else can be derived, data, rules, and energy, the code, compiler, and computer, the Son, Father, and Holy Spirit. That which unites all three is the essence of reality itself. Epilogue Standing under the light of the little sun, you are seized by a sudden urgency that causes you to rush out of the conservatory. The throne room is empty. The djinn, no longer needed, has retreated back into his brass home. The lamp sits lonely, shining under the moonlight, beckoning you with a tempting gleam, and an unknown agency causes you to leap forward, grabbing the lamp and rushing out of the room in one swift motion. You run back down the long corridor, but the once empty halls are now filled with guards where there were none before. They swiftly tackle you to the ground, and the lamp falls with a loud clang as you are left wondering what on earth you were thinking. <laughs> <laughs>